We'll go over vision now. The accessory structures of the eye are the components of the eye that are around the eye that is on top of or supporting the eye ball itself. So for instance, the palpebra are the eyelids. We have an upper and lower. We have six extrinsic muscles that you need to know. The extrinsic muscles are around the eye and they're moving the eyeball around. So here I have a placinated eye that I'm going to use as a demonstration. So the medial rectus will be on the medial side and it'll actually turn your eye medially towards the nose. The superior rectus is at the top of the eye, so we can see that here, and it's going to lift the eye up. Inferior rectus will move the eye down to look down, and the lateral rectus is going to abduct the eye or move the eye laterally. I want you to notice the superior oblique. They are known as oblique muscles because they go side to side, but the superior oblique in particular goes through this little trochlea, which is kind of like a little pulley. Um, inferior oblique just wraps around the underneath side of the eye. And when these muscles contract, they actually move the eye in the opposite direction to where they're located. This image shows you the direction that each of these muscles move the eye. So the superior rectus is going to move the eye up. Likewise, the inferior rectus is going to move the eye down. However, notice that we have inferior oblique pointing upward. When the inferior oblique, which is located at the bottom of the eye, contracts, it actually lifts the eye up and lateral. Likewise, the superior oblique will move the eye down and out, or down and lateral. Here we can see the lacrimal glands. This is what forms the tears, and the purpose of tears is to wash your eyes as well as keep a lubricating film over the surface of your eyes. So when you close your eyelids, it allows that fluid to wick across the entire surface of your eye. They drain in the medial part of your eye and it goes down into your nasal cavity. So if you have an increase in tear production, it's going to make your nose runny because tears are actually coming out your nose. The conjunctiva is a really thin film of connective tissue with blood vessels embedded in it. So we see these blood vessels on the surface of the eye. It is embedded within this layer called the conjunctiva. However, it does not come to cover the part of the eye that light will go through. So we're only seeing the conjunctiva reach up to that point, but it will not continue over the anterior central surface of the eye. The other interesting point about the conjunctiva is that as these vessels come down off the eye, it actually folds back up and comes up the lower palpebra as well as coming around to the inner surface of the upper palpebra. So the conjunctiva actually makes a pocket in your eye of upper and lower. So the idea that someone may have a pair of contacts in their eye and that they sleep with it, it rolls to the back of their eyeball is completely anatomically incorrect. The superficial structures of the eye are the cornea, which is the clear part of the eye that the conjunctiva does not cover. The cornea is continuous with the sclera, so the sclera comes on back here. It's a really strong, tough component of the eye. When we do the eye dissection in the lab, you have to have a really sharp scalpel to even get through the sclera. The iris is the colored part of your eye. And the pupil is the hole that the light comes through, so it's the black part within your eye. We can see that here, where we can see the, well, we can't see the cornea. The cornea is across here, and it's clear. And then the sclera is the rest of the eyeball that comes around, and it is white. And your iris, in this case, is blue in this diagram, but the iris is the part of the eye that has a color, and the pupil, is the hole in the middle and it's black. The internal eye structures include the ciliary body located here. It goes around the lens behind the iris. It is a muscle that actually causes the lens to move and contract so we can focus. 
the suspensory ligaments are little tiny ligaments that are directly attached to the lens, which then attach to the ciliary body. So if the ciliary body is a muscle that controls the lens, which is another way of saying focusing, so we have the ciliary body located here, and it is attached, it attaches to the lens via suspensory ligaments. So this circular thing here is the actual lens. In this schematic, light will come through the cornea, will come through this anterior space through the pupil, and then through the lens, and the lens will bend based on the, where the position of the object is so that you can focus it actually to the proper position into the back of the eye. The choroid is this black portion, so we can see the choroid here is actually this dark blue or purple portion in the eye. It's located right between the white that is the sclera and the interior that is the retina. So the retina in this case is this red, reddish hue portion that covers the entire interior, innermost portion of the back part of the eye. The macula lutea and fovea centralis are part of the retina, and they are this region here. This is the macula lutea, and the fovea centralis will be like the middle center bullseye. So when light comes in the eye, it actually, you when you look directly at an object, you're looking at it. The light from what the object you're looking at is going directly to the fovea centralis and the macula lutea surrounding it. And finally, the optic disc is actually where the um, optic nerve is really formed from all these little axons from all the neural components within the retina all leave the eye through the optic disc. So the layers of the eye are, so there are three main layers of the eye. There is an outermost sort of white layer. Well, it's white mostly, and then it's clear in the front where the cornea is. There's a middle layer that's known as the vascular layer. It's in this layer that we have that black choroid um, portion, as well as the muscular ciliary body that's used to focus the lens, as well as the iris, which is an extension from our ciliary body here to the iris there in front. The innermost layer is known as the neural layer, and this is the actual part of the eye that we see with. This is the receptors for light, and it is made of the retina. So the outermost layer, known as the fibrous tunic, is made of both the cornea, which is the clear part in front, as well as the white part, that's the sclera, that forms the remaining portions of the eyeball. The middle layer, we have the choroid, which is really a dark color black layer right under the sclera, around this posterior part of the eye. The ciliary body is the portion right behind the lens on the posterior part of the eyeball. We already know that it's used, it's muscles that's used in accommodation. Accommodation is another way of saying focusing the lens. It also has another job, which is producing aqueous humor. We're gonna talk more about this in a few slides from now, but suffice it to say is it creates fluid that actually comes around the lens and fills up the anterior portion of the eye with this really watery kind of fluid. Choroid in this picture, I want you to notice, is normally black. So it's black in humans. So we have choroid here. However, in animals that can see at night, we have this beautiful area here that looks like the inside of an oyster, and that's known as tepidum lucidum. So those of you that will dissect eyes within the lab or have seen the inside of the eye, we dissect cow eyes, and so there's a tepidum lucidum portion. Human eyes, however, will only have the choroid, which will only be black. In this picture, we can see a lion with a photograph taken at night, 
and this lion, you can see the eyes are shining. That's because the light from the camera is reflecting right back to the camera because it's bouncing off this tepidum lucidum. So animals that can see very well at night, like cats or deer, or you know, if you're driving along, you see a deer at night and it's looking at you um, with your headlights on, you can see the shine in its eyes, but you don't see that when you shine a flashlight onto a human at night. We absorb the light and don't reflect it back out, which is why we cannot see very well at night. Animals that have this tepid hallucinum magnify and amplify the light that comes in so they can see quite well at night. The ciliary body is this portion here. Now this image is actually a cow eye that's been dissected and it's the, we have the lens in the middle here and the, this is the inside looking from the back side of the lens. So it's if we're inside the back chamber, we cut this off and what we see here is the choroid and then this portion here that has these lines, it looks like corduroy or the underneath side of a mushroom, that is known as the ciliary body. And so you can see how that attaches via suspensory ligaments directly to the lens. The iris is an extension of the ciliary body. It also has muscles, but the iris is this colored part of the eye. And it can contract and actually make the pupil really, really small because it contracts down to minimize light into the eye. Or in low light situations, it can open way up and be you know, way out there and you can have a very large pupil and you are allowing a lot of light into the eye. So the iris is continuous with the ciliary body, ciliary body. It's the colored part of our eyes, but there are muscles in it that allow it to dilate or constrict. So we can see a very dilated muscle here on this side, and we can see a very constricted um, iris on this side. So you can see one allows a lot more light into it, into the back part of the eye than the other. The innermost layer of the eye is known as the neural tunic. The neural tunic is essentially the retina. The retina contains photoreceptors. So we're gonna look into the different types. We have rods and we have cones. And where the axons of these photoreceptors ultimately leave the eye is through an area known as the blind spot or the optic disc. So this is where the axons from the photoreceptors, which are connected to bipolar and ganglion cells, it exits the eye via this optic disc, and then it turns into the optic nerve, which is the nerve leading the whole eyeball. So in this plastinated eye, you can see here's an eyeball, it's the cornea. We have the sclera out here, and then we have the optic nerve coming out the back part. The photoreceptors that we have, there are two types. We have rods, which you can see in green in this image, as well as cones, which are pointy, kind of like a dunce cap, so that's why they're called cones. So the cones are really important for color, whereas rods are not color, but they are more black and white or contrast. So you use rods a lot more when you're seeing at night, at the, in the dark, say it's really dark at night and you're looking up at the stars, you're utilizing rods more than you would on um, the cones. Cones occur when you're looking directly at something. If you're you know, looking at a clock and you're looking directly at the clock, the colors of the clock face are coming in and you're seeing every, and that's center in the back of your eye and that's the highest density of cones. So that's where the macula lutea with the central part being the fovea centralis is located. So the macula lutea has the highest concentration of cones and there become less cones as you radiate out from there, but there becomes a greater population of rods. So if you're looking at something, especially in the evening under low light, and you're looking directly at a tree, for instance, but you can see a bright star off into your periphery. So you look over to the star and all of a sudden it seems dimmer when you look directly at it. That's because when you look directly at a, a bright star, you're looking at it with your cones and it doesn't really pick up the contrast. But if you're looking 
off to the side from it and you're utilizing your rods and your peripheral vision, you can actually pick up the contrast of the stars at night more easily. So if someone has macular degeneration, it is the macula lutea. If you recall, the macula lutea is where we have our cones and our fovea centralis. So right here is our macula lutea, and then in the very center is our fovea centralis. So if light is coming in the eye, going through the cornea, through the pupil, through the lens, it's going to go straight to the macula lutea and the fovea centralis in the middle because that's going to be the highest concentration of cones and that's the very center of where vision is pointed to if you're looking directly at something. Notice in this image though, we have the optic disc or blind spot and it's always off to the side adjacent. So it's all kind of hard to draw in the diagrams three-dimensionally, but you can see the optic disc, it's never gonna be in direct line of sight when you're looking directly at something. So a person with macular degeneration, it is the cones within the macula lutea that are actually not functioning. And so a person cannot see what's directly in the center of what they're looking directly at. And so they're actually having to utilize more of their peripheral vision. And you can see in this image, it's less focused as well as being dimmer. It's not picking up the color as well. In the eye, we already talked about the rods and cones. And so they're located here. The dark pigment here is that choroid. Um, and so the rods and cones, oddly enough, are pointing backwards and away. So in this image where you can see the eyeball where light's coming in following the yellow arrow and it goes to the back of the eye and that's here and that will be the choroid if it had um, and so that's the choroid. The rods and cones are actually pointing towards the choroid however the choroid absorb some of the light so things we actually dim it down a bit unlike animals though with a tepidum lucidum will cause the light to actually come through here and bounce back up more in a to a greater amount than it would for us as humans so our rods and cones are located sort of pointing in towards the choroid now this other set of neurons are ganglion and bipolar cells I just put them in here so that you know what they are, ganglion bipolar cells, but otherwise I really have you not needing to know that. And from there are all the axons that are leaving, and it is these axons that are coming off that really form the, um, the network of the retina that is going to ultimately leave out, here's axons from the other side, that would go out an optic disc and then turn into an optic nerve as it leaves the eye. So the optic disc, as we can see here, notice it's the location where blood vessels are gonna enter and exit. So an ophthalmologist is going to look into your eye and look at the health of the blood vessels, and so you can see them enter and exit this optic disc. The optic disc is also known as the blind spot because there are no rods and cones in that area. It's only the axons from those rods and cones that are exiting here. So it's the optic disc on the inside of the eye, but on the outside of the eye where it's leaving, it's now the optic nerve that's heading back into the brain. So we just went through the three main layers of the eye. We did the cornea and the sclera. And then we did the middle layer, which is the black choroid, going to the ciliary body that's used to focus the lens as well as make fluid to go to the front of the eye, as well as the innermost layer that is the retina, which contains rods and cones with the axons of those leaving via the optic disc. In the big picture of the eye, we wanna see that the front part of the eye is the anterior chamber. So we have the anterior chamber located right in here, and then we have a posterior chamber, which is this whole back of the eye. So it's really divided by the lens and the iris and the pupil and the ciliary body. That sort of defines what's in the front, the anterior chamber or the posterior chamber. So within the anterior chamber, we have fluid that's really watery and liquidy, and that's known as aqueous humor. 
aqueous humor is made by the ciliary body. That's this portion right here. That's the ciliary body. But it is drained by this place called the canal of Schlem. We can see it as a circle here and a circle here. But they're not two tiny circles, one at the top and bottom. The circle actually is like a hula hoop and it's going around the eye on the outside of the iris um, around as a circle. And so it's this drainage tube that's in the anterior portion of the eye. In the back of the eye, in the posterior portion, we have this really thick gel-like substance that's a lot like a raw egg white. So it's clear and it's sort of gelatinous-y, it's sort of like this jello stuff, and it fills up the entire back part of the eye. And the reason why it has to be a little more gelatinous and have a greater substance than the watery part in the front is it's actually holding and supporting the lens in place. So what we see here is the ciliary body is going to make this fluid, this aqueous humor. So it's going to make aqueous humor that's going to come up and come out the pupil and now this aqueous humor fills this anterior chamber of the eye. Then the aqueous humor is actually drained by this canal of Schlem. So forming fluid in the front of the eye, you're making it from the ciliary body while you're draining it via the canal of Schlem. This is another diagram to show that where you're following the red dot, where you're forming it back here by the ciliary body, it comes out through the pupil, but it exits via the canal of Schlem. The visual pathway of the eye is as this. We have the optic disc, as you recall, where all the axons come out of the eye. And so we have what's coming back into the brain in this direction from each eye, comes into the brain, so, so draw it like a little arrow. Those are the optic nerves. So we have the optic, in this case, we have a left optic nerve and we have a right optic nerve over here. This middle portion that is an X is the optic chiasma. It is in this portion of the eye that our fiber tracts are actually splitting. So finally, coming into the brain, we would have optic tracts. So I want you to make sure you know anatomically what these, these three different regions are. The nerves are coming directly from the eye. The optic chiasma is the X and the optic tracks are then going into the brain. So we'll do this again so you can follow the fiber tracks. So we'll say here in the left eye repre is represented by green fibers. So you're coming in from the left eye. So remember I'm calling this the left eye because we're looking at the underside of the brain here. So when it comes into, so this is the optic nerve from the left eye, comes into the optic chiasma and some of those axons obviously are gonna stay on the same side. Some of the axons are actually going to cross over and go to the opposite side of the brain. So really, both sides of our brain can get information from a single eyeball. Likewise, from the right eye, we have the optic nerve, which is only axons from just that eye. When it gets the optic chiasma, some of those axons, some of the information is going to stay on that side of the brain while some will cross over and go into the opposite side of the brain. So what I want you to know about the optic tracts is that optic tracts have nerve fibers from both eyes, where optic nerves are exclusively from one eye or the other. This is another way to represent it where you're actually looking at various fields of vision. And so you're actually, your brain overlaps these fields of vision. And so that's how it's really mapping out when you get to the primary visual cortex. So the pathway, the nerve pathway is really coming from the nerves, which comes from the eye, hits that optic chiasma, then to the optic tracts, through the thalamus, and then ultimately to the occipital lobe, being the primary visual cortex. So here we are. Optic nerves, optic chiasma, optic tracts. 
through the thalamus to the primary visual cortex, which then gets interpreted by the visual association area. You can see this, how it's represented on this image here. When we go to dissect the eye, this is what it looks like from the inside. So in the lab, we'd have pictures here where you cut open the eye. This is the inside. You're looking at the retina. The retina is literally like a wet Kleenex. It's very thin, very flimsy, and it only sticks to the back cup of the eye because it's wet, just like a wet Kleenex would stick to a window. Um, we can see choroid underneath here, the black portion, as well as some tepidum lucidum there. We can see, here's the lens pulled out. This is a beautiful picture of the retina intact. We can see in this portion here, this is the optic disc, where all the axons are really kind of funneling back in, as well as you can see some vessels in there. So this portion is the blind spot. This here is vitreous humor. It's a big blob that came from the back part of the eye. This here is the retina, I know, all kind of folded over and pulled to the side. Like I said, it's like a wet Kleenex. It just gets pulled around and moved around, but you can spread it back out across the eye if you so wanted to. So I wanted to go through a plastinated eye that I made and show you some of the features that we just talked about. So on this eye, this is a cow eye. We have it cut open, so we'll see this portion in a little bit. But I wanted you to see that we have the optic nerve sticking out the back. We have the cornea here. The cornea would normally be clear. You can see right through it, but because of the preservation process, initially we put this, or I put this in formaldehyde and it clouds it so we don't see it as clear. We can also see some of the muscles, the extrinsic muscles here. These are various rectus muscles. I don't know which one's which based on this. Um, so we have the optic nerve, which is quite rigid. Can I hold on to this from here? So when we turn around, we can see the inside of the eye. So we can clearly see that there is an anterior chamber as well as a posterior chamber. And we can see the lens in, that's sort of dividing the two. If I were to cut the eye this way, I have another eyeball here. So here's the cornea in the front of the eye and it's been cut. So we'll turn this around and we can see the inside of the lens this way. This is the lens. We can see, hopefully you can kind of see the textured pattern here where it looks a little like corduroy or the underneath side of a mushroom. That is the ciliary body. And then we can see on this portion, it's a little shinier, more dull looking. That's because that is actually the choroid with retina on it. I think I have another eye. In this eye, we can actually see the retina kind of wadded up off to the side, so it's a damaged one, but it does a nice job at showing us the tepidum lucidum inside, as well as the dark part that is actually the choroid. This is a posterior portion of the eye. So we have, so if the eye were together, I don't know if these two pieces really match, but if we have the cornea, we can see the behind portion of the lens here with the ciliary body, with the choroid with some retina on top, and on the back, we can also see the retina. We can clearly see where it's coming in or it's going out this portion of the eye via the optic disc. And you can see a little bit here, if we were to lift the retina up, I don't wanna chip it, but that's the choroid underneath that. So you can see if light were to come in, it's gonna hit that choroid and actually dim a little bit. Unlike if it was going to be on the tepidum lucidum where it would bounce back more and light up those um, rods and cones more fervently. So in this particular model I have here, I tried to preserve obviously a really long optic nerve, but if we look inside just right, you can see that the optic disc, where everything's going to converge here in the optic disc, in this particular one, everything's converging the light. You can see right there, and it's exactly on the opposite side of where the optic nerve actually is. All right, hope you, um, that, hopefully that helped you even though you weren't able to do some of your own dissections. Let me know if you have any questions.